thanks, Ron. You may be wondering what a guy from the desert's doing coming here talking to you about grass-fed and this and that. And I was sitting up there thinking earlier, there's an old guy out in our country. He's no longer with us anymore, but he was probably born in the late 1800s. And I remember he gave an interview to Livestock Weekly once. <clears throat> and they said, uh, you know, he was talking and he said, you know, everybody thinks it's so hard to ranch out here in the, this old dry country. He said, it's really pretty easy. You just got to understand one thing. It's going to rain one time every year and you got to make that grass last till next year. So that's kind of kind of a general idea that I'm maybe going to talk a little bit about. <clears throat> Believe it or not, we do have a grass-fed producer, well, <laughs> a group of them that are kind of in a cooperative in, in my county. <clears throat> and uh, you may wonder, well, how does that work out there in that old dry country? And they're, they're uh, visiting with, up here with Trent a minute ago. Their, their model is they're, they got a bunch of country, probably 200 square miles between the two of the cow-calf producers. And they couldn't make it work if it weren't for their third partner, who is a uh, irrigated farmer. So they take 30 calves. They're the guy that buys calves for them needs needs 30 calves a month, and they'll go out and they they're again their particular model. Both of them run your bulls year round, so they can go out and they can find 30 calves and bring them in. And they'll their model is to put them on on silage, and that fits their program, and that's how they get the weight on them. And uh, again, I, I run up and down the road all the time talking about calving seasons and managing this and that. And, and their, their deal is because they run bulls year round, they've generally got a great supply of calves. And Neil likes to say, I've got a, I've got a breeding season. It's usually about 30 days after the last rain. But uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, I'm just, again, the, the concepts here, whether you're in deep east Texas where your tools and your tool bag are going to be <coughs> forage quality and all the wonderful things you can do with forage. We talked about East I-35. I guess Ron invited me to come talk to represent the other two-thirds of Texas. I don't know, but <laughs> that's kind of is a magic line there for raising high-quality forages and stuff. So we throw this term out all day. And because it depends, my... Uh, my definition is how many and for how long for a grazing period. And that grazing period might be defined by your rotation or it might be defined by your rainfall patterns or your seasonality or whatever system you're using. Maybe it's a best pasture system. But grazing system and carrying capacity are two different things. And we get calls all the time from people that confuse those two. I'm fixing to buy a ranch. I've just bought a ranch. I, they tell me I can run this many cattle, and you know maybe you can, but carrying capacity is really an, a long-term average for stocking rate, and it might be decades out in my part of the country before we can figure out exactly what a carrying capacity for a particular ranch is. Where it rains more, you may be talking five, ten years, but it, it's basically a long-term average. Okay, so I always try to make the distinction between what those two things are. So I saw this ad in a publication right before I came, and I cut out the other stuff, but Northeast Texas Cattle and Horse Ranch runs 100 cows and got a bunch of other stuff in the, in the ad. And so, you know, somebody buys this and says, well, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe running a grass-fed operation on that. And let's walk through the, through the business plan on that if you want to talk about it. So when we talk, talk, talk about stocking rates and carrying capacity, we, we talk a lot about animal units, and that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's just a way for people to communicate with each other about, about those two things. So the definition of an animal unit, you can read it in any old pasture management book or range management book back to the 1950s, I guess, or 40s, or maybe even before that. That's the classic definition of an animal unit. That's how old it is thousand pound cow okay so a thousand pound cow calf pair that means as long as the calf's on the cow for a reasonable period uh, usually about seven months after that some of these lease people and stuff they'll start count even if the calf's still on the cow they'll they'll start counting that calf as a as a part of an animal unit itself so it's a cow calf pair that would be one animal unit but really who has thousand pound cows anymore 
So really, most people are probably talking about 1.3 animal units per cow now. As we said earlier, most cows are probably somewhere between 12 and 1,300 pounds on average in the country. And uh, we can talk about animal unit years. We can talk about animal unit days. But one bull is going to be about, again, he's more than 1,300 pounds. So a bull's just going to do the math. He's about 1.8 animal units. We talk about animal unit years, animal unit months, animal unit days. Okay, And we'll run through a little bit of that. <coughs> So the animal unit is really based on that picture right there. So that's a thousand pound heifer, okay? And that's about the amount of pic picture amount of the dry matter requirement she's gonna eat in, in a day. If that was green ryegrass, it'd probably be two or three times that size, right? Because of all the moisture in it. But that's basically what, what drives that concept of animal unit. So that's an animal unit day right there how much forage she's going to eat in a day, and that's about 2.5% of their body weight, okay? I don't know why this thing isn't advancing. <coughs> so let's just go back to that, now that we've kind of got that picture in our head, let's go back to that 100 animal unit ranch, and let's say we want to do the math on what, what we're going to do with all those animal units. We've got 100 cows. Let's just say we're pretty darn good managers, and we're going to get an 85% calf crop on average. So we got 42 steers and 42 heifers to work with. What happens if we want to keep all those steers and heifers? Obviously, if we're going to put them into some sort of a program, we're going to have to make room for them. Okay? So we'll have to adjust the carrying capacity. So here's kind of the way I went through that. <coughs> Let's just say, and, and again, Monty showed wonderful pictures today of weaning 800-pound calves off the cow. Well, Monty knows how to do that. He's in an environment where that's possible if you know the right thing to do at the right time. Uh, maybe you have a different, different program where you're going to wean a, a different weight calf, but it's just for ease of math, most calves are going to wean somewhere around five to 600 pounds. Let's say they're going to gain a pound and a half a day, so that's going to take them uh, to 1,000 pounds. That's going to take them about uh, 333 days at a pound and a half to get there, all right? So the average between 500 and 1,000 is 750, so that's 0.75 animal units each one of those calves. Is that kind of making sense to you? Okay. So <coughs> they're not a whole animal unit, right? If they were a whole animal unit, that'd be 333 animal units, but they're three quarters of an animal unit. So we multiply 0.75 times however many days to finish. That gives us 250 animal unit days. We want to convert that back to years so we can kind of keep the cows and the calves on the same apples and oranges. That, that comes out to a point, about 0.7 animal unit years. That's really pretty simple math. I've got a little spreadsheet I made to help me not make any errors to carry over. And if you want that, I can give that to you too. So one called these stalker steers or heifers. So that's equal to about 0.7 animal units. Again, that's adjusted for the 333 days it's going to take them to to make a thousand pounds. So we have a, a hundred animal units year long to work with. So we want to keep all those steers and heifers. Um, after weaning, probably need to sell about 40 cows just to make room for them. Okay. Now, what's going to change that? Maybe we're not selling them at a thousand pounds. Maybe we're selling them at eight. Maybe our specs say we're going to have to sell them more than that. Um, Another big thing is average daily gain. That's a pound and a half. Did Monty tell you what he could get off some of his forages in Overton? It's pretty good, but he's got something for him to gain on every day, every day and every month of the year. Okay, so weaning weight and average daily gain is going to be the key to how long it takes these animals to finish. So now <coughs> we got about 60 animal units of cows because we had to make room for them. Let's say we got that same 85% calf crop. That comes out to 51 steers and heifers. As we said, those are going to be worth about 0.7 animal units. So that works out to about 36 actual animal units of calves. There's 51 head, but this is, this is what they're going to come out to by the time we keep them for 333 days. So they're a year and a half old. And just remember, if we're in a sort of a self-contained thing, if we're not buying replacement heifers, um, 11 of those 51 calves are going to have to go back into the replacement. So don't forget about that. 
But if you add all that up, then, oops, that's not showing up, but we've got, showed up on my, on my uh, non-apple. So we've got 96 animal units of cows and calves here. And we've got, don't forget about our bulls, right? So by the time we add a couple of bulls to that, we're right at about 99 animal units, which is back up to what we said that ranch could run, if that ad is correct. Not really. It, uh, <laughs> it all adds up to 100, okay? So 99. And again, I've got the little spreadsheet for that if anybody wants it. All right, well, that was fun. There it is, right there. So all we really had to do to put in on that spreadsheet to help me do my math, we put in our cow numbers, all right? We knocked those down to, from 100 to 60. We put in our calf crop. Spreadsheet calculated that. We put in our average weaning weight. We have to put that in. We have to put in our uh, average daily, well, put in our finish weight and everything else is calculated for us in that spreadsheet, okay? Well, that was fun. What do you guys really work with? Carrying capacity or stocking rate? Carrying capacity is a long-term average. I mean, that's fun for long-term planning. I bought this ranch. I want to I want to budget forage out, you know, figure out what I can tell my banker I'm going to be doing 10 years from now. But when you go home from here and you go home and you start working with whatever forage is out there or not maybe not out there compared to what was out there even a month ago, I come to College Station way more than I want. <coughs> Ron didn't hear me say that. But <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to me what's changed down here in the last three weeks. I was here three weeks ago, and it's already, and it's, it's that way all the way over here. The biggest change to me driving over was between about Ozona and Fredericksburg. Boy, they looked good three weeks ago. So really, what you guys work with is going to be stocking rate year in and year out. And that's, again, how many... How many is going to be determined mostly by forage quantity? How much is on the ground? Okay. How long that average daily gain is going to be determined most, mostly by forage quality? A lot of what Monty talked about. So to me, if I could boil this thing down for you guys to go home and start making decisions about what to do, I think just understand Forage quality and forage quantity as being two almost different things. And then just basically understanding some basic principles of animal nutrition, ruminant nutrition, how these feeds work. And we're going to cover that because knowing what feed to put in what place at the right time can help, help you manage that, that process, okay? We got a bunch of really, uh, somebody talked about stockpiling forage earlier. It's going to be a lot easier in our country to stockpile forage maybe than what Monty could grow over there in East Texas. Why is that? Huh? Exactly. So that goes two ways. The more rainfall you get, the more growth you get, right? The more growth you get, what do you tell you? The more undigestible fiber you get. So in our country, it's easy to save grass. It doesn't, it doesn't rain and it doesn't get very tall. And so knowing something about what the problems are in that forage and maybe how you can fix it with the right supplement in the right time is, is good stuff to know, I think. Okay? So there's nothing wrong there, I guess. Anybody could, anybody could do this if they had that 365 days a, a year, right? That's easy. We got quality, we got quantity, probably more quantity than you can get around. But as we know, that anybody that ranches knows there's, it's getting through the hard times. The easy times are easy. It's, it's getting through the hard times that hopefully get you back to the next time you get into this situation. Okay, so picture I snapped out out west. Obviously, on top there's neither quantity nor quality. The bottom picture, believe it or not, we would call that quantity out there. But it's the dead of winter, and and even for us, that's pretty low quality compared to what it could be later in the year. You know, that's probably on average in that bottom picture, probably somewhere around 6% crude protein, which is be pretty good for native country in this part of the world. But So <coughs> to answer that question, how much forage do you have? I would say 
there's a few ways to answer that question. That would be probably what most people do, and an educated guess. I think the uh, educated is the most important part of that statement there. It's really hard to make an educated guess if you don't have any experience to back it on. You know, you can go out there and look all day long, and if you don't really know kind of what you're looking at, you really are just guessing. And you know, people that have been doing in the business or been on the same ranch maybe for generations, they're really good at this. But if you're in new country or you're new new to this, you probably need to have some some help or some ways to train your eye. Okay. So the classic textbook method to, to measure forage is to go out there with a frame and throw it on the ground and clip it and weigh it and do all these mathematical exercises so that we can figure out how much standing forage is there. I don't know really many people that do that. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a lot easier in this part of the world than it is where I live. Because your pastures are smaller. You're, you've got less variability out there. Okay, So that's really the, the right way to do it. Okay, If you don't want to do that, I would suggest you take a, take a kind of a hybrid between those two things and educate yourself a little bit. So instead of having to go out there all the time and clip and weigh and do all this, you train your eye to go out there and look on the ground, and now you know about how many pounds per acre you're looking at. Because if you do this a few times, write it down. You know, I think there's, right now, I think there's 1,000 pounds per acre. Write that down, do that, weigh it a few times, do the math, and you can train your eye. We talk about Body condition all the time. We look at cows. We can, we can estimate body condition. We can estimate yield grade by looking at fat cattle. And you can do the same thing with, with forage. I would say any time you're out there either doing estimates or actually measuring it, be sure to think about season of the year. I mean, it's not going to do any good. You know, three weeks ago <laughs> in College Station, to have gone out here and, and tried to guess how much because it was growing so fast. I mean, it it's not a problem. So I think the most important time to spend time out in the pasture looking or measuring or just standing out there and, and looking is when we have a time when the forage growth has slowed down. I mean, whatever's there is going to have to last till the next growth cycle. That's either going to be, in your part of the world, the winter time. Come down here in the winter time and it's green. I can't believe it. Uh, so. Winter time is just something you can plan on every year. Or you're going to have your last first frost probably in late October and probably won't get any real green up until maybe April. So you got a long time to have to budget whatever's out there on the ground. Here around College Station, it amazes me. I come down here most winters in February, and they've already got ryegrass started. And so you've you, you got to take into you know where you are and what the season is. But droughts happen everywhere, right? And so if you're going into a time even when you're supposed to be getting regrowth and you're supposed to be getting that ryegrass in College Station in March and it's not here, like a few years ago I remember it, dang sure wasn't. Go out there and, and that's the way to, the time to look and say, well, how much do I have and how long it, is it might maybe going to last till I get the next rain? So what we're really talking about then You know, train your eye to recognize that. And again, for some of y'all, that might be a pretty short pasture, but we'd be pretty happy to have that. That's 2,600 pounds per acre in that one meter square. And you can clip that and weigh it and do the math, or you can train your eye to, to recognize that. We actually have some publications that have pictorial guides of this. There's about half that amount. And then that's often what we get. In some situations and some dry times and all that. So how long will it last? Let's just run through an example. And this is native range country, but it, it could be you know, a dried out Bermuda grass pasture somewhere. It doesn't have to be native range. But let's say we have 1,000 pounds per acre. Monty told you this morning something about grazing that top half or the top third. So we have an old rule we call take half, leave half. We want to leave that especially on native range country. We want to leave that half back just to help soak up the rain when it falls. If you're on other type of grasses and stuff, 
where does the grass make its, make its food from? Right, remember, this is whatever in his name, biology class, right? Photosynthesis and chlorophyll and all that. They gotta have leaf, leaf matter on the plant to grow again when it does rain. So we wanna, we wanna leave a portion of that forage back behind, ungrazed if you will. So there's half and half, of the thousand pounds now, we, we have 500 to work with. But really and truly in most grazing systems, about a quarter of what we plan on grazing really isn't available. It's either lost to trampling, where you have higher stock densities, trampling can be a big loss. You get out even in our part of the world where there's <laughs> probably no real trampling, but we have things like termites and weather and just things that make it unavailable. So we, we say that animals are about 25 to maybe 35% efficient in harvesting what's out there, okay? If you wanna be 80 or 90% efficient, run a hay mower over it, okay? So <coughs> let's say we've got uh, 250 pounds per acre now to work with, times the number of grazable acres in the pasture, that can be important in native country. Let's say that we got 1,000 pound animals out there, so 2.5% of their body weight is 25 pounds a day. Let's just say there's 3,000 acres in the pasture. That's how much total forage we've got allocated that we went out and measured or, or guessed at. Let's say there's 200 head, gives us 150 days of, of grazing. Um, if, if they were to stay out there 180 or 90 or 200 days, they would know no difference, would they? They'd still be eating. What would they be eating? They'd be eating that, okay? So that's where you get into these sort of downward spirals, okay? So <coughs> Monty, and I think it's been mentioned several times today, talked about rotational grazing, high intensity, short duration grazing. It can improve harvest efficiency maybe up to 30, 35%. But that's the quantity side, right? We're grazing quantity of forage beyond what they really want to eat. We're making them go eat it. So you guys are in this game of balancing both quantity and quality so you can get the weight gain on these animals and get them up to whatever finish weight you have. So to me, and I think Ron mentioned it earlier, the whole key to one of these systems is that so this pasture looks like that pasture the next time we come back in to graze it. And if it doesn't, what are we eating? We're eating that part that we wanted to leave back ungrazed. So these systems take a whole lot of management and they take really, you know, rain, the more higher rainfall, the higher chance you have of having that regrowth happen before it's time to come back on the next grazing cycle. So everything's kind of a, a mix and match and a trade-off, right? So it's quality and quantity. All right, if you don't want to go clipping way and you're still a little bit, you know, uneasy maybe about how much forage do I really have out there, another quick way to maybe do it on, on uh, introduced pastures, particularly monocultures, where we just have a few maybe different grass species to worry about growth forms and whatnot. Bermuda grass is a classic example. Uh, our colleagues over in Overton and stuff will tell you this is probably an easier way to get it close to Bermuda grass and actually having to go out there and clip it and weigh it, just measure stubble height or estimate stubble height, okay? And so <coughs> on these Bermuda grass, we'll use an example. If this pasture for the entire growing season, let's say from April till August, if on average that pasture never was allowed to get any taller than that for the growing season, that's about a a two inch average stubble height, and that's about the root growth you could expect from that because there's just not enough photosynthesis going on because there's not enough leaf matter there to allow regrowth. So that's not a sustainable thing. Now, if you took it down to that level and you were in a rotation where it could get back up to where it needed to be, things would be fine. And, it, and you rested it long enough for it to catch up, okay? So on average, we want to keep Bermuda grass somewhere probably above about a three inch double height on average for the growing season. We'll get root growth like that then. So if we do get in a dry spell and the soil gets a little dry, the roots are down deeper and it, it can have a better chance of surviving. And so <coughs> anything above about a, a four inch 
on a for a growing season you're going to get you know even more root growth and that's even more sustainable so that's kind of the idea behind stubble height okay if you've not heard of ranch tv i think i'm being recorded for it right now it's a great place to go there we are there's more stuff on there you could probably spend two weeks <laughs> but this stuff's all on there okay um, it's a great resource, I think. If you go there, go to the home page, go to video library. You can take BQA or other classes or find out where to go to take them. But if you go to video library, for example, how many video, how many playlists do we have now? 70, 80? And say, so, okay, those are just the playlists. Within playlists, those are grouped by, by category. So within playlists, there might be anywhere from five to maybe on beef literacy, a hundred different videos. Okay, so it's a good thing we have the playlist because it kind of condenses stuff down. So for instance, if you wanted to go see my smiling face, if you haven't seen enough of my ugly face today, you can go back and go to grazing management there and go through that for the, I, I kind of cover the, the native range side and, and Jason Banta, my coworker over in, at Overton, he'll cover the stubble height and you can get a little more in-depth on this. It's just one example. Uh, if you wanted to go learn about saddles, you could go here. The guy gives a great talk about saddles if you're interested. He's a heck of a saddle maker. I'm just saying the, the variety is, is, is French TV. Gosh. It's an apple. I'm going to take a chance. There we go. Okay. All right. So to kind of, kind of put, bring this quantity and quality thing down to just a, a nugget here. If the forage is growing and green, but maybe getting mature, what, what do I think of when I think of growing green, mature forage? First thing that comes to my mind is College Station, Texas in the month of August. It's getting pretty stemmy, it's getting pretty rank. I'm worried more about quality than I am quantity. I'm gonna go out there and try to take a forage sample and send it off so I can have some idea of what I'm dealing with. A lot of times just a touch of protein on those deals makes all the difference in the world. If I'm going into a sure enough dry period, it's drought, it's December up at McLean, Texas, and the snow's just melted and we haven't got any more regrowth, I'm probably going to do some sort of a forage measurement for quantity. Okay, and you're either going to be looking at estimating or clipping for pounds per acre or maybe measuring for, for stubble height, okay? All right, so how do you measure some of this stuff? Let's, getting weight gain on a, gr on a grass-finished animal, okay? Well, the first thing I want to know is what kind of actual average daily gain do I need to get for whatever market I'm trying to produce for? Is it one of those milk calves right off the cow that I really maybe not have to worry about that? Have I got some guy that says well, I need a thousand pound live animal or a 800 pound carcass or whatever it is you're trying to get to? Have some idea of what kind of average daily gain you need. So is forage quality a problem? Maybe. Is soil fertility, Monty mentioned that, that's a great way to attack that. You know, manage your soil fertility on these introduced pastures. Uh, it's kind of hard to run a fertilizer truck out over native country where I live, but a lot of y'all are going to be in that production system. So what nutrients are needed in the animal's diet if we've got a problem up here? Okay, And that's where forage testing can help answer this question. But you've got to know a little bit about the nutrients know which which ones of them to feed so how much should I supplement if I need to uh, and then if you want to use high quality forage as a supplement because some of y'all may be limited as we said on what type of supplements maybe you can't use urea or you can't use a grain cube or a, even a, a cottonseed cube that might have grain in it but don't forget you can you can have <coughs> high quality forage that you can kind of use as a supplement. You know, you've got some really, really high quality clover, for instance, and you don't have enough for 
all those calves we wanted to keep back, fence that off, turn them in there on that clover for, I don't know, a few hours every day, uh, a day every four days. You use that as a, as a supplemental source for protein. You can use alfalfa. We, we even out where I live, you, we use alfalfa hay as a protein supplement in pastures where you can get a hay truck in. Sometimes that's the, that's the hold back there. But we're not using that forage as, a, as an energy source. We're using it as a source of supplemental protein, OK? <clears throat> so back to these nutrients. How, how do we know when to use forage as a protein supplement? And why would we do that? So let's just step back. We talk about protein, we talk about energy, all this, all the time is interchangeable. And it's real important, I think, when you start figuring out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it to, to understand. And hopefully this won't be a biochemistry lesson because I barely got through that class. But. So protein is made up of amino acids, right? They're just, they're put together in, in feed and forage. They're broken apart in the body. We reassemble them to make hair, blood, muscle, whatever we're, we're doing. It takes energy to do that at the cellular level. So protein and energy are big parts of feed. Where do we get energy in animal feed? Mostly, I don't care if you're a traditional beef producer or grass-fed, whatever, most energy is going to come from the cellulose. That's the digestible portion of that fiber. Okay? So cellulose provides the vast majority of energy in a grazing animal's diet. We can also use starch. Some of those are going to be off limits to y'all. Some of them, maybe not. And don't forget fat. Fat's got two and a half times the energy of corn. And it does the same thing. It provides energy. Well, why don't we just feed a bunch of fat instead of, because the, the, that's the good news. The bad news is there's a, there's a limit on how much fat they can have in their diet before they quit eating. So there's a limit. You know, somewhere around four to five percent of the rations. What's the form of fat? Oh, any a lot of these supplements will have added fat, and it'll tell you right there. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we've got vitamins and minerals and all that other stuff. All right. So I said, energy is the roughage is the main source of energy in the diet, and so managing grass gets back to managing energy, right? Okay. So. Again, when you start thinking about how to, how to get the most out of whatever's standing out there, whether it's green growing grass or whether it's old rank grass maybe that's pretty low quality, knowing a little bit about how a, a ruminant animal uses these nutrients is, is really helpful. So there's the best way I, I've come up with saying it after all these years. <clears throat> you're not feeding livestock. You're not feeding cattle. You're not feeding sheep or goats or deer or whatever ruminant you're trying to feed out there, you're feeding the rumen microbes, OK? So what do I mean by that? So those amino acids have nitrogen in them, right? The nitrogen's broken apart in the rumen, and it makes ammonia. The ammonia feeds those rumen microbes, OK? So where does she get her protein from? If the amino acids in that bite of green grass got broken apart to make ammonia to take care of the microbes, where does that cow get her, her, her protein from? She digests her own microbes in her small intestine the same way I'm digesting my fajita right now. Okay? Well, maybe a little bit later. It's got to get there first. Okay? So the first order of business is to make ammonia to feed the microbes. And that's a balancing act, right? If she's digesting her own microbes and getting the amino acids out of those microbes, they better be reproducing at a faster rate than, than they're being digested, OK? That's called degradable protein, or uh, usually that we call that degradable protein. All right. <clears throat> so microbial protein from the digestion of rumen microbes is that cow's primary source of protein. We talked some about bypass protein, which is specialized types of protein that it basically escape that whole process and go straight to the small intestine where they're, but by far she needs the gradable protein to keep that rumen healthy and going. In addition to ammonia, those, those microbes also need uh, glucose, sugar, okay? So they'll take uh, 
any carbohydrate, whether it's cellulose or starch or those plant sugars Monty talked about on the inside of the cell this morning, any of those are carbohydrates. So the carbohydrate goes into the rumen, it's turned into glucose. The glucose uh, feeds those microbes. And in return, the microbes make these things called volatile fatty acids. They go out into the body and they're turned back into sugar and that's where she gets her energy. So those are the, that's the way the rumen works, okay? So that's all great to know. So getting back to what, what you guys do every day and what you're going to go home and try to do. So just knowing 7% crude protein in the diet, and that may be a 100% forage diet, but there's going to have to be at least 7% crude protein in that forage at all times just to keep that rumen happy and keep those microbes going. If it's a cow and she drops a calf, just remember that's going to double because she's making milk now. Okay? And there's, there's things that affect that to a minor degree. So <clears throat> what can we do with some of this? Long ago, it would be the same today if we were to do the same research, but just as an example, Back in the 50s, I think they did this. They took some little old heifers in Nebraska. They fed them some terrible prairie hay. It was probably that tall when they cut it. It was 4.2% protein. Is that seven? Nope. So they fed them no supplement. They ate about nine pounds of hay a day with no supplement, and they lost almost a pound. They were starving to death. Okay. So they gave them some corn, a pound and a quarter of corn a day, they ate the same amount of that hay and they still lost over a half a pound a day. Is that because they were consuming evil corn? No, it's because corn has no amino acids in it to speak of, right? That was rumen, the rumen, the first thing the rumen needed was some amino acids and some protein. So they fed them the same exact amount of a, a supplement that had some protein in it, as well as energy. Look what hay intake did. They just ate more of that nasty stuff and actually started gaining a little bit of weight. So that's an example of how you would use protein to take care of really an extreme example of how you would use protein to take care of a truly, truly undigestible source of, of roughage. I'm not saying that after we got that problem taken care of, maybe putting another pound and a quarter of corn in the diet probably would have done even more for them. But the, the, the weakest link in the chain there was that rumen environment and it just wasn't getting enough amino acids and enough nitrogen in that rumen okay I'm not going to talk about that because we're not that's not anything y'all could use so we've done all this stuff we know a little bit about energy we know a little bit about protein we back up and we say how do we know if our animals are getting what they need I would say if you're growing animals on grass and you've got a stalker animal you need to weigh them if you can. If you're looking at your cows, uh, body condition and fat cover is, is the way we usually assess that. We can, I mentioned forage sampling. You can look, go out there and take a forage sample and if you know they've got X number of requirements for growth and, and maintenance and that forage is meeting it, at least you know that. Uh, sample hay, I would say any of you that are feeding hay, that's, that's a big one put all this time and money into either buying or raising hay, and it's the same concept as forage sampling, either the forage is going to meet their requirements or it's going to have to have something to go with it to get that done, and you're not going to know unless you test it. There are some, uh, uh, you can take fecal samples and send those off to a lab. We'll basically tell you the same thing as forage sampling. It's, it's a pretty good estimate on, on, on most forages. It's not perfect. I think it's a little more probably accurate on the protein side than the energy side, but that is one more tool in your toolbox there. And then don't forget that one. What do I mean by that? You mind a cow pie, didn't it? And what's that cow pie sitting on? Green grass, isn't it? So what he's talking about, that rate of passage going through that rumen is fast. They got high rate of turnover, bugs are happy, cows happy, she's getting it in and getting it out. When you start seeing st this manure stack up, that means at least you've got problems at the rumen level. You might have a cow pie like that and you're expecting three pounds a day of gain on these animals and, you know, they, you know, that might not be it. But that at least tells you the rumen's happy and we're meeting basic 
function, and if we need to go on from there, we can go on from there. We also have a publication on that with pictures if you want it. Unfortunately, they didn't title that manure or whatever. It's, it's what's it called? Esti ca estimating diet quality or something like that. But it's got, got pic pictorial guides of that. <coughs> Forge testing laboratories, I don't mean to pick any, but the Dairy One Lab is what all the pointy-headed nutritionists I know use. We've used this one in Amarillo. Um, if you have a choice, they'll sometimes give you a choice on your forage analysis. Do you want wet chemistry or NIR analysis, which is what they use on those fecal methods? Usually, if you'll pick wet chemistry, that's the default. My colleague up at Overton tells me that the Dairy One lab he has extreme confidence in for their NIRs, but not all labs are the same on NIR, he tells me, so you need to know a little bit about that. So if you don't know specifically about the lab, you're probably better off picking wet chemistry. Yes. Yes. My, I've got my experience on, upon which I make my recommendations. My recommendation is it's a tool in your toolbox. If it don't depend entirely on that. You have to look at your cows or steers or whatever you're doing and if you don't believe it, don't believe it. I've seen some, like you, I've seen some really weird stuff. We did some sheep a couple years ago in the dead of winter on energy and they came back like 60% TDN in the, it, I didn't believe that, okay? What, what the nutritionists, and Ron may want to jump in, but what the nutritionists tell me they have equations based on forage bases. So they've maybe got a million different equations or samples on which their Bermuda grass equation is based on. And so most of the time those are going to be pretty accurate. If you get out into places where the forage is really variable, like maybe where I live, and you just got 50 different species in the pasture and it's just not as, as predictable. And again, I think the protein is a little more reliable than the energy side of that. If you want I, anything to add there, Ron? That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah. So, you know, the recommendation is if you're, if you're hand feeding, like, say, range cubes every three days or whatever, catch them and do the sampling the day you feed them, and that stuff will have already passed through, hopefully, from the last time you fed them. But with self-fed, it, it's, it's anybody's guess. So that's kind of why I had that towards the bottom there. I think if you've got the ability to go out and actually do a representation, representative sample of your forage, and if you've never done hand-plucking forage, don't just go out there and start grabbing Look at kind of what the cattle are eating and try to pick a little more leaf than stem, you know. And uh, if there's no leaf to pick, well, maybe you need to go next door to the pasture and pick some leaves because they've already gotten the goodie out of that, okay? All right. So hay quality, uh, you can do that that way or you can take an electric uh, power drill. It's a little easier, but you'll get a report back um, on, on your your quality, okay? So it's somewhere around fifty dollars. Um, just again on on self-fed supplements, just some things to think about. But you know these things are usually priced by all these supplements are usually priced by the amount of protein that's in them. So these are going to be your cheaper supplements. Why are they cheaper? They got to eat more of them, right? To get the same same deal. So if you've got some animals that you're really really pushing, you're probably going to want to Error on the side of those more complete or, or higher, higher quality, higher, higher protein supplements. Just uh, another little exercise in how protein works. You know, I know y'all are in here on grass fed, but the starch thing can, can get some people. So I always kind of show this as an example of when uh, this was done out in New Mexico when I was actually in school out there a long time ago, but they just took two, two different trials of heifers, two different years. They looked at feeding a high-quality protein supplement either once a week or twice a week. 
And the bottom line was there was no difference in performance on these heifers if they fed them either once a week or twice a week. The whole message of that little example there is it was the right supplement in the right place at the right time. What do I mean by that? At plenty of dry, dormant forage, and again, it's back to taking care of the weakest link in the chain there, which is the rumen, the rumen microbes. There's going to be times where you're either short on grass or other, th other times where that, that wouldn't work. So the right, the right supplement in the right place at the right time, okay? If you've not ever read a feed tag, Again, that's going to be something, y'all. if you're going to be feeding supplements, you're going to be reading a lot of feed tags to make sure the right stuff's in there and the wrong stuff's not, right? <clears throat> but the one thing I always tell people on a feed tag, you won't see energy represented on a feed tag. I don't know why that's not required, and it, it's a point of, of concern. So uh, you can get some estimate of energy value off of fiber, but just, just know that, okay? So... Just to, to walk us through this, uh, kind of adapted this from a publication that Ted McCollum up in Amarillo has done, but he's, he's got this out there as example. So this is the example I just showed you where they were supplementing those heifers either once or twice a week. Forage availability is not limiting, but the quality of protein is low. So what do we need to do first? Make sure that's taken care of. So forage consumption is low because the microbes aren't happy. So we feed a small amount of supplemental protein, probably more than 30%, highly degradable. You all forget about the NPN statement there, but highly degradable. You're probably looking at 0.1 to 0.3% of body weight per day, and you can do that once to three times a week, whatever you want to do. That's a pretty efficient deal. That's where a lot of people will end up sooner or later if you're ranching, right? Forge is often limiting in quantity. So forage availability either may not be limiting right now, but it may be limiting in the future. Quality may be limiting as well. So how do we get protein and energy into them, right? We said roughage provides the main source of energy, but if the roughage is short or running low, how do we get extra energy into the animals, which is the challenge y'all are thinking about, at least, by being here today. So. Most growth is going to occur from energy. You know, protein is good for helping digest forages and, you know, meeting those basic requirements. But most actual growth is going to have to come from energy, okay? So now we're looking at a supplement 20 to 30 percent lower in protein, higher in energy. Uh, and we want to try to pick one out there that is maybe kind of a special type of supplement that's going to have what we call digestible fiber, which is a little you know, better than, than common fiber, and the sources of those are not real, not a wide array of those, but some of those sources would be wheat nids, corn gluten, Ron said, may or may not be available to you, but that's, that's one source of digestible fiber. Rice hulls, soybean hulls, you know, your feed guy can help you with this. They know, they know how to find this stuff and, and design some of this stuff. So these are going to be relatively high fiber. I just have cubes on here. It could be any feed, but it would be a high fiber cube that's also pretty high in energy. Now we're looking at about 5 to 10 pounds of supplement. The other thing you might have to do if you're getting low on standing forage, again, is what everybody's always done, but you know, don't forget about replacing forage that's not there with forage that maybe we've cut and put in the barn last summer as a contingency for this, okay? Uh, I just threw that in there, thinking that some of you might be on highly, highly high-protein diets that are forage species that have a whole lot of degradable, uh, abnormally high amount of degradable protein. Uh, I think Ted picked annual ryegrass as an example of that, where that's a very specialized situation. So sometimes, not always, you'll get a response with some of this escape or bypass protein. If I was talking to a normal, uh, you know, conventional you know, system that the way to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> a conventional system, the way to solve that problem is to just put a bunch of starch in there and get that ro ratio back into, into balance. But you may not have that option, so you're going to be looking at something like fish meal or, or something like that. Y'all you know, are special. Y'all are. <laughs> <laughs>
So, and then cottonseed meal might be an intermediate. But I, I, the only, the only I don't, again, the only reason I put that up there is because you all may not have the option of s solving that problem an easy way. And it's easy to solve that problem if you've got those feed stuffs available. But if you don't, again, you're going to have to learn maybe a little bit more about basic rumen function and animal nutrition so that you can solve some of these problems in an unconventional way. Okay. All right, so in summary, manage forage quantity to reduce energy needs. That's standing forage. Use the right kind of supplemental protein that will maximize forage intake. If you're trying to figure out if what I'm doing is working, body condition, weight gain, cow pies, that's in, uh, and then I would put forage analysis and maybe that NIRS at the end. It's still a, a good tool if you want to use it in conjunction with those others. Uh, so, as I, s doesn't show up there, but that basically says you can't manage what you don't measure. So, <coughs> you've either got to go out there and weigh these cattle and weigh these stalkers to figure out if I'm getting to the point I need to get to. Um, you know, that's a set of load, load bars if you don't recognize what that is. You can put those load bars under any stable object and you can weigh your cattle pretty easy. You can go out there and clip and weigh. You can go out there with a, with a yardstick or if you're good enough, you can walk out there and look at the ground and, and answer those.